Hi everyone, in today's video we are going to discuss the Big Bang Theory, which is the dominant explanation today for the origin of the universe. Uh, the Big Bang Theory says that the universe began around 14 billion years ago as a small point which underwent rapid expansion. Uh, it was like a capsule of energy and as it expanded, the energy eventually uh, got converted into tiny particles and then bigger particles like atoms and then these uh, clouds of gas got consolidated into stars and galaxies and eventually into planets and then life evolved and that's how we're here. So this is basically what the Big Bang Theory states. Um, there are the, the important points that are relevant for us is that the theory states that the universe began at a finite time in the past, the universe is finite in extent, and the universe is dynamic. These are the things that the theory claims. Now, before the Big Bang theory uh, got acceptance in the scientific community, uh, there were other the theories about the universe, and these theories posited that the universe was static and eternal. That is, the universe has always existed, and the universe today is just the same as it was billions of years ago, and so on, all the way back in time. This was the dominant uh, view in the scientific community uh, before the Big Bang Theory, but now, most people in the scientific community believe in this Big Bang Theory, which means that uh, they believe that the universe is not eternal, uh, it's not infinite in extent, uh, it had a finite beginning, and it has a finite extent. Now, today, if uh, you ask an atheist, what's the explanation for the universe in the world, uh, universe today, he would say that, you know, this is how it happened, and he would narrate the Big Bang Theory. So today, the theory is used as an explanation of the origin of the universe without God. Um, it's not a proof that God does not exist, because it is conceivable that if there was a deity or a, or a, or a God or a creator, I mean, he could have created the universe using the Big Bang Theory. So while it is not um, a proof that atheists offer against the existence of God, at the same time, they feel that it is a sufficient explanation for how things originated without God. Now, although this is the case, uh, this was not how the theory has always been perceived. Uh, since this theory, in contrast to the other theories about the universe, since this theory claims that the universe had a finite beginning in time, it was perceived and it is still today perceived as supporting the Bible, because it agrees with the Bible that there was a beginning for this universe. So Robert Jastrow was a prominent uh, astronomer in, uh, with NASA and with uh, various other organizations, and uh, he, he wrote a book called God and the Astronomers. So he says, for the scientist who has lived out his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance he is about to conquer the highest peak, and as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. So what he's trying to say is that, you know, scientists are finally coming to the same conclusion that the theologians or the Bible students have always held, and that is that the universe began uh, at some time in the past. And he goes on to say that, the astronomical evidence now leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. Uh, the essential elements of astronomy, the astronomical account, that is the Big Bang Theory, and the biblical account in Genesis are the same. So he finds a lot of similarities. He mentions here that the details differ. So to be honest, we have to point out that uh, while there are some similarities between the Big Bang and the creation account in the Bible, there are also significant disagreements. It would be doing injustice to both the Big Bang theory as well as Genesis to claim that these two agree with each other. Now let's look at the Big Bang theory. Uh, we are looking at it from a biblical Christian point of view. Um, you know, if I just wanted something to agree with, 
if I wanted to get validation from the scientific community, I could very well say that the Big Bang Theory agrees with the Bible and so it proves that the Bible is true. But that is not true. Uh, that's not a valid uh, and accurate description of reality. So we are going to give a critical look at the Big Bang Theory. So first, let's look into the foundations of the Big Bang Theory and see how valid these foundations are. Uh, the theory relies on the general theory of relativity, which uh, Einstein gave, and uh, this is the theory that really made Einstein famous and gave him a reputation of, uh, you know, being an intellectual that was really way up there above the rest of humanity. So it's a complicated theory, but um, it's a remarkable theory because it has come through whenever it has been tested. So there have been some dramatic uh, experimental conformations, conformations of the theory of relativity. So full marks to this as far as it goes. Uh, we have no quarrel with the general theory of relativity. It has proven to be true uh, wherever man has looked. I mean, tomorrow we might discover something that violates the theory, but as far as our current understanding is concerned, uh, it seems to be true. Uh, then there is the principle of homogeneity, which states that nature obeys the same rules everywhere in the universe. Now, man has not been everywhere in the universe. We live in a small part of the universe, which is called the Milky Way galaxy. And, and within the Milky Way galaxy, our solar system is a small speck, and we haven't even crossed the solar system. So uh, it seems certain or it seems likely that nature obeys the same rules everywhere or at least uh, the version of the rules that we have been able to uh, come up with based on our studies it's probably the same version that applies everywhere uh, this is reasonable at the same time we must acknowledge that it's an assumption assumptions have to be pointed out for what they are so um, while we don't have any direct refutation of this, we cannot say that this is true either because the human race has not reached the further extremes of the universe to put this uh, principle to the test. Then there is the principle of isotropy, and that is the universe looks the same in all directions everywhere. And again, this is an assumption. Um, and in fact, this is a loaded assumption uh, in the in the Bible, uh, there is a creation account in which the earth has a special place. Uh, even the rest of the Bible suggests that although God created a universe that's very big, the earth has a special place in his mind. He is specifically concerned with what happens here. Uh, so the idea that the earth is special is repugnant to to atheists or to people who don't believe that there is a purpose to the universe. So this is a loaded assumption. Uh, it, it wants to say that, you know, the, there's nothing special with the earth. The universe looks the same in all directions and from every vantage point. Now, this is an assumption that is simply not proved. There's no way to test it because no one has been to another galaxy or no one has been to a distant part of the universe and has looked in different directions. At least the previous assumption is true to some extent in the sense that we can say that, um, okay, we studied about the laws of physics on Earth and then we were able to send spacecraft to the moon and to other planets. So at least the things that we learned with our Earth experiments are valid to some extent outside the solar system or outside the Earth's orbit. Uh, the same thing cannot be said about this one. It is just a naked assumption. Uh, Wyatt Gibbs, um, uh, one, uh, an astronomer, writes like this in the Scientific American. So he says that people need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the observations. For instance, I can construct you a spherical symmetric universe with the Earth at, at its center and you cannot disprove it based on the observations. So even if the Earth is close to the center of the universe, or it's not, there is no way to prove or to disprove a statement like these. These are just assumptions. So we should note that while the Big Bang's foundations 
uh, include the general theory of relativity, relativity, which is a tested theory. It also includes unproved assumptions. Now we're going to look at the evidence that is claimed for the Big Bang Theory. There are four main pieces of evidence which are referred to as pillars. The first one is the observation that the universe is expanding. Astronomers believe that the universe is expanding. Now, um, this is a universally believed uh, principle in the astronomical community, but uh, for those of us who are not familiar with astronomy, it's important for us to note that nobody ever sees a galaxy move. What we actually see are various indirect signals. Uh, we see something called a redshift. The light that comes from a distant galaxy is redder than the similar light that is emitted from on the Earth or that is seen on the Earth. So that's called a redshift and that suggests that the galaxy is moving away. Uh, we have special types of stars called Cepheid variables. Uh, there are explosions called supernovas and scientists have observed certain patterns among these stars and their explosions. Uh, these, are, these are called standard candles and these principles are extrapolated and they are used to deduce that you know, this is the distance of a certain galaxy from the Earth and uh, how fast is this distance changing and so on and so forth. We must note that these are not direct observations. They are uh, indirect uh, observations or conclusions that are drawn indirectly from other observations. So while it's perhaps true that the universe is expanding, we must note that if there is something wrong in today's understanding of Cepheid variables, if there is something wrong in the understanding of redshift, you know, if uh, a cosmological redshift is confused for a gravitational redshift, uh, if something is wrong in our current understanding of these things, then this conclusion is subject to be questioned. Uh, how does this compare with what the Bible says about the creation of the universe? Um, the Bible suggests that the universe has expanded, at least in the past. Uh, here it is worth noting that when scientists say that the universe is expanding and they say that distant galaxies are going away from us, uh, actually the, uh, the, the distant galaxies that we observe today, we are observing them in the state that they were in the past because it takes light a long time to travel all the way from those distant galaxies to us. So uh, even if we say that the universe is expanding today, the, the more accurate or the more modest way to put it would be that we know that the universe has expanded in the past. But that is something which the Bible also suggests. The Bible says that God stretched out the heavens like a curtain. And even today we speak of the fabric of space-time having expanded. And uh, in a prophetic book called Isaiah, God says, I have stretched out the heavens. So did God stretch out the heavens and did he leave them to continue stretching? So is the expansion continuing today? The Bible does not really clarify that. But if the expansion is true, uh, that is something which can be accommodated within the Bible as well. Uh, what we will keep observing as we look at these evidences is that many of these evidences don't specifically prove the Big Bang, but rather they refute the earlier theories about the universe being in a steady state. Uh, the earlier understanding of the universe was that it was static and eternal, and the expanding universe disproves that. So in that sense, it supports the Big Bang theory. There is a background of microwave radiation that seems to permeate the universe. Again, we haven't been everywhere in the universe to really check that out, but it seems as if this fills the whole universe. And according to the Big Bang Theory, uh, such a background radiation is supposed to be expected. Um, there was a time when the universe was opaque with radiation and then uh, uh, the energy got converted to particles. So there is radiation that has been left over from that epoch. And so such a radiation was expected according to the Big Bang Theory 
and here it seems to be and thus uh, uh, Big Bang advocates would take this background radiation as evidence for the Big Bang theory. Uh, the Bible also says that God in a dramatic event, he lit up the whole universe. So there was darkness initially and then there was light. So there was a big flash of light as the universe was lit up. And then God stretched out the heavens and um, this background radiation could well be a leftover of that globe. Even today, the Big Bangers also consider the uh, CMBR as the afterglow of the Big Bang theory. Uh, it was supposed to be not initially microwave, it was supposed to be much shorter, but the universe has supposedly expanded and so it has got stretched out to longer electromagnetic waves, namely microwaves. Uh, according to the Bible also, if there was a flash of light at the start and God then stretched out the heavens, you could expect a similar expansion. Microwaves are much longer than visible light. We must note that not all the features of the CMBR are in agreement with the Big Bang theory. So we won't get into uh, the details of these features, but this is just uh, one news report that BBC made where um, uh, th there was a set of observations made of the uh, CMBR called the Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe. And some of the features that it found uh, were sort of surprising from a Big Bang point of view. Uh, in particular, this report claims that uh, the universe may not be the same in all directions. Well, that was one of the foundation assumptions of the Big Bang Theory. And this data seems to question that. So one can't be too dogmatic about these things because uh, the data are continuously being refined. But the point that we are trying to make is that it's not just set in stone that everything has been proven and everything has been determined for sure. There are still a lot of unanswered questions. The third pillar of evidence for the Big Bang Theory is the nature of galaxy distribution that we see in the universe. So when, when we look far out into the universe, we see some galaxies nearby, and then we see other galaxies that are distant. Now, uh, there seems to be some difference in how these galaxies look. So the distant galaxies seem to be less well-formed, uh, less uh, definite in their shape. Uh, they look a little blue compared to the nearby galaxies and you can see these distant galaxies in the background so the shapes are not very clear to, uh, clearly defined they look blue now what's the big deal about looking blue that suggests that they have a high population of young stars young energetic stars and according to the big bang theory the first generation of stars was um, was ma were, was massive and big and uh, massive stars uh, have a shorter lifespan, but they have a greater power output and they also tend to shine bluer than the more gentle second and third generation stars. Uh, the star forming nurseries that are supposedly there in these galaxies also show a difference. The distant star nurseries seems to be more turbulent, more violent than the, uh, the, the nurseries in the nearby galaxies. There seems to be a difference in which the older galaxies seem to look young, energetic and turbulent and the, uh, the, uh, the closer galaxies, which are supposed to be the more, which we are seeing at a later age, uh, they seem to look more mature, more steady, more calm. So it seems as if this agrees with what the Big Bang Theory says, that there has been an evolution or that there's been a progress in the, uh, in the formation of galaxies. The distant galaxies from which the light has taken a longer time to reach us, so we're looking at them in the past, they seem to be younger, and the nearby galaxies from which the light has taken less time to reach us, they seem to be more mature. So this seems to support uh, the idea that the universe has undergone an aging process. Again, this is not out of step with the Bible. Um, even according to the Bible, there has been a creation at a finite time in the past. And if we are looking into the past, we should see galaxies younger 
than what they are today. So uh, this, this piece of evidence really refutes the steady state theory of the universe being static and eternal. And it agrees with the Big Bang theory. And it can also be accommodated in the context of the Bible. Now, this is somewhat off topic. Uh, but one of the main questions that one, uh, one has in connection with the biblical cosmology is that uh, if the universe is very young, as the Bible suggests it is, how is it that uh, stars seem to be so far away, like billions of light years away, and the light seems to have taken billions of years to reach us? Now, there are many explanations of, uh, for this question. Uh, one of the favored explanations is this, that as God would have stretched out the universe, there would have been a significant amount of time dilation. And so it's possible that uh, the earth uh, has undergone a time, uh, an age or a time lapse of just about a few thousand years, whereas other parts of the universe have simultaneously aged by millions and billions of years. Genesis was written from the standpoint of the earth. So uh, this evidence again is just shows that the universe has had a finite age and there has been some evolution or there has been some change and that agrees with Genesis as well. The fourth supposed pillar of the Big Bang Theory is nucleosynthesis, that is the formation of the elements. And the uh, Big Bang Theory supposedly correctly estimates the composition of the universe. So 75% is hydrogen, 25% is helium, and very little is everything else. Well, there are uh, other light elements that are present in some amounts like lithium and deuterium and so on. Um, if you look in closer, you see that only the abundance of around three or four elements has been correctly predicted. And uh, there are discrepancies. Uh, there are parameters that the theory mentions. And based on the values of these parameters, we get predictions about the, the composition of the universe. So in order to get the right answer for one element, uh, the parameters need to have certain values. And when you set those values, then you get the wrong answer for other elements. So it's not uh, perfectly fitting the data. Uh, there are some things that seem remarkably, remarkably in agreement, but there are other things that disagree. So there are these nagging features of these so-called evidences that show that they're not perfect. Then the fifth evidence for the Big Bang is the dark night sky. The fact that the night sky is dark uh, disproves the idea of an infinite and an eternal universe. If the universe was infinite and eternal, then any line drawn from the earth towards the sky would eventually hit a star. And so the night sky should have been filled with stars. And so the night, night sky would have been white. Um, so the night sky is black. There are only small parts of the sky that are filled with stars. And that suggests that the universe had a finite beginning. Well, this refutes the steady state theory, but it also agrees with Genesis. So this is our look at the evidence for the Big Bang Theory. We see that no doubt there is some evidence, but more than confirming precisely the Big Bang Theory, what this evidence does is that it refutes the idea of an eternal universe. And a lot of these pieces of evidence are also consistent with the Bible. Now we look into some problems with the Big Bang Theory. Uh, there is a concept called the shape of space. Um, is space basically flat or is it curved? Now, if you, if you drew a straight line on the ground, on the earth, if you drew a straight line, and you think you're drawing a straight line and you go on and on and on and on, you would eventually come back to the same point because you're actually drawing on a sphere. The earth is a big sphere. So what seems to be straight is really curved. So now in three dimensional space, suppose I draw a line and I keep going and I keep going and going straight as far as I can see. Will I really go straight and straight and away and away from my starting point or will I trace some sort of curve back to where I started? So is the universe like the planet Earth 
a round object, uh, a curved object, so that I will come back to my starting point when I try to draw a straight line, or is it truly flat, or is it truly straight? Uh, conceptually, there are different possibilities, but it seems to be that the universe has zero curvature. So space is Euclidean, space seems to be flat. Now, what does that have to do with the Big Bang Theory? According to the Big Bang Theory, when the universe started, uh, how the universe is going to evolve? Is it going to become a flat universe or a curved universe? That is going to depend on certain parameters. So it turns out that to have a flat universe, there has to be a very precise amount of matter and energy in the universe. So to have a rapid or random explosion or expansion uh, with a very precisely uh, fine-tuned amount of matter and energy doesn't seem to fit. So if flatness is there and flatness is caused because of this fine-tuning, that suggests the hand of the hand of a creator. So that does not uh, agree with the Big Bang theory in general. So this is called the flatness problem. Now, uh, based on the fact that the universe is flat and the Big Bang theory's interpretation of this, there's got to be a certain amount of matter plus energy in the universe. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I will refer to this amount of matter as 100. Okay, so much of matter needs to be there in the universe. Now, when we take our telescopes and look out at the universe, what we see shining is just a small fraction of this required matter. So if 100 is what we expect from the theory, 2.5 is all that we see, the various stars and galaxies that shine. Now, these galaxies also interact with each other gravitationally. So since the gravitation theory refers to the mass, uh, we can also make some conclusions about the masses of galaxies looking at the way they interact with each other. And there, we find that galaxies seem more massive from their gravitational interaction uh, than what they seem from the way they shine. So gravity seems to show that there's more matter out there in the universe, around 31.6. This by itself is not a big problem. It could be that some of the matter is not shining. It's somewhat dark. It's not very visible. So perhaps that's why you have this discrepancy. But now there is a twist to the story. The Big Bang Theory, uh, from the nucleosynthesis point of view, predicts that the amount of matter plus any matter in the universe should be only 4.9. So now you have a problem. What we see shining is less, which by itself is okay. There could be some matter which is dark, not so not luminous. But now the Big Bang theory predicts that there should be only this much, whereas gravity seems to show much more. So what scientists have thought is there must be some dark matter out there, which is not just dark, but it is completely different from anything that we know of because the Big Bang Theory predicts the amount of ordinary matter in the universe, and that's just 4.9, whereas it seems like there's 31.6 out there, which means that the remaining has to be an unknown or a so-called non-baryonic dark matter, which means that it's an exotic stuff which nobody knows anything about. All we know about it is that it's dark, it does not shine, and that it interacts gravitationally. And what about the remaining uh, re remaining part of the 100? So the explanation for that is there must be some dark energy out there. So in the process, what has happened is that the theory claims that most of the universe, that is, apart from the 4.9, in other words, 95% of the universe is made up of stuff that we know nothing about. And it's made up of stuff that we have thought of just to rescue our theory. You cannot claim that you have explained the universe when 95% of the universe is stuff that is supposedly completely unknown. There's yet another twist to the story. 
There is a theorem called the quantum field theory, and it also predicts the existence of dark energy, but the amount that it calls for is 10 raised to 120 times that which the Big Bang theory requires. Now, 10 raised to 120 means one with 120 zeros. This is like the biggest discrepancy in physics that there is. So there are a lot of unanswered questions. Now, is the quantum field theory correct? Or is the Big Bang theory's understanding of the flatness correct? I mean, one of them has to be wrong. Uh, is there really this dark matter and dark energy out there? Or is there something wrong with our theories? Somewhere or the other, there seems to be a problem. Uh, the Big Bang theory has to rely on uh, speculations, on things that have been thought of just to rely, just to rescue the theory. So to summarize, most of the universe is made of stuff that we know nothing about. So we cannot claim to have explained the origin or the evolution of the universe. There's another problem called the horizon problem. Now, when we look out into the universe, we are able to see around 14 billion years in terms of time. We are able to see, or at least we think we are able to see 14 billion years out or out into the past on all sides, on either side of the universe. So which means that uh, the distance between two ends of this so-called observable universe here is 28 billion light years. So you have, um, you have particles and you have parts of the universe that are separated by such a huge distance. And this distance is so big that according to the age of the universe that the Big Bang Theory claims, there has not been enough time for light to pass from one side to the other. So there has not been enough time for heat to pass from one side to the other. And yet, the cosmic microwave background radiation that we spoke about earlier is uniform everywhere. So it looks like things have been evened out. At the same time, based on the size and the time, the, the age of the universe, uh, there doesn't seem to have been this opportunity for evening things out. So this is called the horizon problem. Uh, if you cut a magnet into two, you still have two poles, that is the North Pole and the South Pole. So if, if I take this magnet, I say, okay, this is the North Pole and this is the South Pole, and I expect that if I cut it, then one half will be the North Pole and one half will be the South Pole. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, when you cut a magnet, each fragment will have a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, if we were to have only a South Pole or only a North Pole, that's called the, that, that, that would be called a magnetic monopole. Now, the Big Bang Theory predicts the existence of magnetic monopoles, but they have never been found. So this object here on the right, the magnetic monopole is a hypothetical object, never been found, but predicted by the theory. So the obvious question is, why, is uh, why are we not able to find something that the theory predicts? There was an astronomer called Alan Wood. Uh, he, he was at MIT for some time and later on in different universities. Uh, he came up with an idea. So this is, uh, this is a picture of his notes. And he says that uh, he has come to a spectacular realization and that is that if we hypothesize that the universe had a phase of rapid expansion in its early development, then we can avoid some of the problems that we have. So he says this kind of supercooling or expansion can explain why the universe today is so incredibly flat and therefore res resolve the fine tuning problem. The fine tuning problem is basically the the, the observation that, you know, it seems as if there's a hand of a creator behind the universe. So that's a problem for atheists. That's a problem for the Big Bang Theory. Uh, so Alan Good came out with an idea which was called inflation. And that is uh, a rapid expansion of the universe in the very early stages of the Big Bang. Now this inflation, if it indeed took place, can solve the horizon problem, the flatness problem, and also the magnetic monopole problem. But then we have to also note that such a thing is not proved. The inflation is not something that we have observed. 
Yes, we can look into the past when we look out into the distant galaxies, but we don't see inflation there. So it's not been observed, but it's just been thought of. Why has it been thought of to rescue our theory? So today inflation is a standard belief in the astronomical community, not because it's been observed, but because uh, it props up the Big Bang theory. So you have these crutches that the theory relies on, non-baryonic dark matter, dark energy, and now we have inflation. But even with these crutches, there are other problems. Sometimes, you know, dark matter to the extent that scientists can understand it seems to contradict what they already know, the little that they already know about it. So dark matter uh, interacts gravitationally, but this is a recent uh, news item which says that there was a galaxy cluster that was observed and the dark matter in it seems to be bending light much more than expected. So uh, everything doesn't seem to fit. Uh, we think that there is dark matter out there to explain one set of observations. So once we have all our fudge factors uh, uh, aligned to get the right answer here, then we see something else. And then the same fudge factors are not able to uh, explain the observations that are new. So everything is not sure and tried and tested. There are problems. There is a well-known problem called the missing satellites problem. And uh, that's the uh, observation that whereas the Big Bang theory predicts that when a big galaxy forms, it will uh, be accompanied by thousands of satellite galaxies. What we actually observe is only a few. So this is Andromeda galaxy, which is uh, our galactic neighbor. It's a, it's a monster of a galaxy, a huge galaxy. Uh, the Big Bang theory predicts that it should have many satellites. It has only a few. Now, one possible explanation to solve this problem is that perhaps many of those satellite dwarf galaxies are too small and too faint, and that's why we are not able to observe them. Well, then it turns out that that creates a new problem. And that is that uh, the theory itself predicts that the satellite galaxies shouldn't be so small and so faint. So that's called the too big to fail problem. So the Big Bang theory predicts that these satellite galaxies, not only would they be numerous, but they would be big. So they shouldn't fail to show up. And yet they seem to be failing to show up. So this is called the too big to fail problem. The galaxies should have been too big to fail, but they are failing. They are failing the Big Bang theory. This is a paper which asks, is there a too big to fail problem in the field? And the answer given by these researchers is yes. What they mean to say is that it's not just the Milky Way and the Andromeda which give this contradiction, but even when we look at distant galaxies, we still see a too big to fail problem there as well. So you have this widespread pro problem, an unsolved problem in physics. One, would actually, one should actually say an unsolved problem for the Big Bang Theory. Uh, the Big Bang Theory predicts that, uh, that there is dark matter surrounding galaxies in the form of a halo. And it predicts that the uh, halo should be uh, concentrated like a cusp near the center of the galaxy. But what we see is that it's more evenly spread out. So this is called the core cusp problem. So there's a dis discrepancy between the data, uh, the observations, and the theory. So what we see is uh, a uniform distribution of matter, whereas the theory predicts that it would be more concentrated where the radius is less, that is more concentrated near the center. So again, you have a problem, an acknowledged problem with the Big Bang Theory. Uh, there's another problem called the angular momentum catastrophe. Uh, what this means is that uh, the Big Bang Theory predicts that when a galaxy is formed, it would be formed as a, as a small stocky object, whereas the galaxies that we actually see forming are nice and big and slender and spinning nicely. So that's called the angular momentum catastrophe. Again, an acknowledged and unsolved problem. Then there is the uh, problem of the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. 
So this is how the CERN website uh, explains it. Uh, the Big Bang should have created equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So why is there far more matter than antimatter in the universe? Now, all the matter that we see around us is what is called matter. And then uh, there is something else called antimatter. That is particles that are similar in some ways and yet contrasting in other ways to the particles that we know of. Now, antimatter is sometimes produced in small amounts in nature and also in the laboratories, uh, in accelerators. But according to the Big Bang Theory, there should be equal amounts of antimatter and matter. And that doesn't seem to be the case. The universe seems to be almost exclusively matter. So this is a mystery. Then we have the problem of star formation. Um, stars are supposed to be gas that has condensed together and got compact. But uh, we, we know from our common observation that stars don't, that gases don't compress together. Uh, they actually disperse, they tend to spread apart. And that's exactly what the computer simulations show as well. Uh, the Big Bang advocates have got various explanations for how star formation might have taken place. Uh, some of these explanations involve invoking an explosion, a supernova from an older star. But then that only passes the buck and then it raises the question, how did the first stars form then? How did the first generation stars form? So the formation of first generation stars is an unsolved problem for the Big Bang theory. So the well-known uh, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson says like this, the scary part is that if none of us knew in advance that stars exist, frontline research would offer plenty of convincing reasons for why stars could never form. There is much in the Big Bang Theory that suggests that stars would never form, yet they are there, and that is an unsolved problem. The nebula hypothesis, which is like an addendum to the Big Bang Theory, is a theory about how the solar system must have formed. So the hypothesis says that there was um, a cloud of gas which got uh, which got uh, uh, which was spinning and then it arranged itself into stars and fragments and then a star and uh, planets so here also there are a lot of problems or unsolved uh, questions one is the sticking problem uh, if you look at the our solar system you have many asteroids but they don't have the tendency to stick together and form a bigger planet so small particles don't stick together and form large rocky planets. So then how is it that the rocky planets like Earth and Mars were formed? Some of the planets uh, like Venus have retrograde motion. They rotate in the opposite direction. Now, according to this hypothesis, they should rotate in the same direction as all the other planets. So this is a problem. And there are just so stories that uh, scientists have thought of to explain these things. Now, you could say that, okay, maybe there was some collision in the past, or maybe this happened, or maybe that happened, but these are only speculations, and they should be recognized as such. Uh, if you look at the oxygen in the Earth, oxygen in the Sun, uh, there are different varieties of oxygen called isotopes, and the proportions of these isotopes in the Earth and in the Sun are not the same, and this seems to conflict with the common origin that this nebula, nebula hypothesis posits for the sun and the earth. And then you have something called the faint young sun paradox. According to the theory of evolution of the sun, the, the sun should have been uh, very faint a couple of billion years ago. But then according to the theory of evolution in biology, uh, that's when life began on the earth. And so the sun would have to support that life. But according to the the theory of evolution of stars, uh, at that time, the sun would have been too faint to support life. So if that's the case, then how did life evolve on the Earth? So these are innumerable questions that have not been answered. And the Big Bang community looks at these questions and says that, okay, maybe we'll find an answer in the future uh, within the framework of our theory. But what they're not doing is questioning whether the theory is valid at all. Uh, it seems to be in their minds that if the universe is not static and eternal, then the universe uh, has to, uh, uh, you know, uh, that then the Big Bang theory is true. Uh, but that is 
uh, a case of uh, a false dilemma. You're not considering other options that might be there. To summarize, we would say that a theory with uh, problems with crutches, uh, artificial concepts that are invoked just to rescue theory with unanswered questions cannot be accepted as fact. Uh, you cannot say that, you know, this is how everything happened. This is how we know it all. Uh, you cannot say that, well, if anything disagrees with it, then that must be completely false. So this theory cannot be used to discredit the Bible. Now, to be fair, the six-day creation of the Bible hasn't been proved either. So we are not saying here that we are astronomers who have proved that the universe was created in six days like the Bible says it was. But what we are saying is that the Bible has been proven true uh, in so many other places where it could be verified. So there is good evidence that the Bible was written by the creator, the one person who did it all. So in Genesis 1, the creator has spoken and he has told us how he did it. The Bible is not a science textbook, so he has not given us, um, the creator has not given us elaborate details but he has given us a brief outline of how he created the universe. And since the Big Bang Theory is fraught with all these issues, it's not correct to say that uh, the Bible should be jettisoned in favor of the Big Bang Theory. Thank you very much.